Welcome to Leadership Live, and today I am delighted to host Simon Gersler and Robert Curtis. Welcome. Thank you, Daphne. Great to be on the show. Yeah. Excited to to be here. (laughs) So Simon and Rob are co-founders of Pipe Global, a startup that helps companies think and act differently about their sales and marketing by providing hands-on solutions and expert advice at every stage of the sales pipeline. Both Rob and Simon have come from careers in tech and exits that have allowed them to now create this wonderful partnership and build Pat Global. I love the stories that you share, Rob and Simon. I'm looking forward to a really juicy episode here. And I'm just going to share some of the surprising details that you shared with me before we started uh, recording. And that is that, Rob, you have a dream to be a news anchor. And Simon, I know you have a wicked sense of humor that allows you to add a funny twist to all of life's life's experiences. So today we are going to hear tips about what it's like to build a startup with a co-founder, what are the key tips for success, and some of your personal stories that have helped shape you, Rob and Simon, as experts and leaders in your field. So I would like to start with, just let's get into some of the learnings. You know, there are there's a journey, a career journey that you've had here and you've had some wonderful learnings and I'm, I'm going to start with you, Rob, because you said three key things. Take chances, network like crazy, and say yes, even when you're not sure. So I thought those are wonderful, juicy bits to start with. And tell us a little bit about those, those key learnings that you, you've taken from your journey so far. I think, I think the key one there out of all three, actually, is the network like crazy. If I think back to every stage of my life, even from being a, you know, a teenager, um, most opportunities and um, new directions and new contacts, friends, pathways, my wife, all came from networking like crazy. So give us an example. Tell us a story about a crazy networking experience, you know, whether it's how you met your wife or something to do with business, either we don't mind or any. Well, look. G- given that we're on a uh, pr- business professional podcast, <laughs> I'll use I'll, I'll save the uh, more juicy personal life to a different version of the podcast. But um, the I think probably my my own emigration story to Israel, my Aliyah stories, is pretty incredible actually. So um, for many many years, I'd wanted to to move and live in Israel, but my wife always said to me, "Never." And <laughs> being a salesman, I'm like, "No, there's no such thing as never." What are the conditions under which you might wow. move to Israel? I and love that. Some- Hold on a sec. I love that. Like, just pause there for a moment. As a salesman, there is no such thing as never, right? So you start turning it into what are the conditions that can happen in order to change that frame of mind or way of thinking. Awesome. Okay, that's already great tip. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Look, I don't want everyone to think that, you know, most of my life and my engagements with my wife, family, friends, <laughs> kids were all negotiations, <laughs> but um, this one was. And she threw out some crazy number, like $50 million in the bank. You can you can tell me where to go. I'm wow. with you on the plane. I'm wow. like, look, at least I have a number. At least I've got a number now to work with. Um, year after year, I worked that number down, not actually with money in the bank, but in negotiating her to a lower <laughs> level. <laughs> okay, okay. Wow. And, and, and the years go by. A lot of her family do move to Israel. And then... There comes a point where I think it was about, it was the January of 2011. I'm on holiday in Israel meeting these people that I didn't actually know. Uh, My wife knew them. We're having a, we're having a a, a nice dinner. And I get this speech from the person saying, look, you know, you're not a real Zionist. You know, you're, you're not moving here. You're not putting conditions on yourself to move to Israel. And I said, well, you know, I need a proper job. I've got a family. I need, uh, you know, a proper runway to actually, uh, you know, support everybody. And he said something along the lines of leave it with me. And I was like, yeah, big talker. Right. And well, Rob, this was a stranger, someone that you were having dinner and how, how we, did... we were, no, we were having dinner with a couple that I didn't know before. My wife okay. knew them. Okay. And, and, and basically it, he said something along the lines of leave it with me. And I was like, yeah, sure. This was like the January of 2011. Months and months and months go by. It's the summer of 2011, August. And my wife's last sister, so there's four of them, had all moved to Israel. And my wife's there crying, we're the last (laughs) ones left. And I'm like, yes, we are. 
And mm. uh, now's my time to to really negotiate and say, look, over the next year or two, maybe we can move to Israel. And she's like, yeah, I think so. So randomly, this person I'd met in January, literally days after I'd had that conversation with my wife in August, messages me and says, call me. I call him. A week later, I'm in Israel talking about their business and how I might join that business as part of the founding team. Three weeks later, wow. we moved to Israel. Wow. So the whole process from wow. that initial meeting to wow. moving to Israel was basically a month. Yeah. And it's with this person back in January that I didn't know. And I said what it was that I wanted to do. And one thing led to another. So networking is everything. Mm. Keep meeting people. Find ways to help them. Find ways to continue those conversations. People don't keep up conversations with people on an ongoing basis. And that is a, a big leadership thing I would actually share, whether it's you know team members, colleagues, other leaders, people in your market. You've got to keep networking as yeah. a systemic process so that you actually can, can draw outcomes from it. But I think you're saying two things there about networking. Networking is one, meeting new people and you never know where opportunities can come from. Could be dinner with your wife's friends, or it could be just being at a place where you're meeting people and talking to people and those are new people. Then you have people that you already know and continuing to keep up the conversation, keep in touch with them. And I think both of those are really interesting aspects of networking that are difficult for people to do. But then Simon, let's hear your take on that maybe. What do you, how do you see networking and what do you say to people who find that difficult? You know, it's hard to, where do I meet new people? How do I strike up conversations? And also a little bit on how do I maintain and keep those conversations going if I've got not much to say? Um, I think networking needs to be very natural. So I think the the more sort of formal you are about it, the harder it is to pull off. It's when you're trying too hard that it comes across and often repel people that way. So it needs right. to be especially that desperate, needy thing. I need something from you. That's not going to work. We know that exactly. So the, the most successful examples I've had of networking over my entire career have all become come from sort of almost like coincidences, you could say. But they, when you look back, they weren't coincidences. You weren't mm. trying too hard. That they were natural conversations. When you go in with an agenda saying, I need to speak to this person about this topic, et cetera, then I find that, that it's pretty transparent and okay. you need to be as natural as possible. And then but then, that's some preparation. I need to speak to this person about this topic. There's a little bit of preparation that goes into that, understanding who you need to speak to and what are you going to speak about. Yeah, I, again, I think that's too formal. I think it's oh, the, okay. the opportunities need to be more natural. And oh, that's where okay. You come from when, you, when it's more natural. There's not an agenda-driven um impetus that's led to that particular initiative okay. okay yeah i understand so you're saying actually the opposite not to over prepare and over analyze actually just kind of go with the flow where, where do you meet people no it doesn't mean you can't meet people in various settings but i i know people that have you know wanted advice on networking and they've been from the mindset that networking is very almost like forensic you need to speak to this person about this topic, et cetera. And that, that's not the way to network. The, the way to network it is when you're just literally almost like brushing past someone in the corridor, you stop and say, hey, didn't I think I saw you here before or, or aren't you so-and-so's cousin? And those are the, the type of relationships mm. that take off because they're, they're, they're natural. They're not staged. Okay. They're not rehearsed in, in advance. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the magic normally happens. I think if I could just, just add to that, Daphna, um, you were – coffees and my 500 coffee campaign was exactly what Simon's talking about yes it had a system around it and that I wanted to meet 500 new people that I didn't know before and but come with absolutely no agenda I wasn't right. selling anything I right. wasn't pushing anything right. and I had no desire to to to, to get yeah. something from that person it was much more about learning who you are how we might collaborate in the future given what I know about you now and um that process generated lots and lots of incredible new relationships yeah. but more importantly in terms of business bottom line because we are in business those coffees generated hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue for pipe global really? that because is because of the businesses that came of it came from, from it. just from having and i think just say a little bit more about that initiative because that was awesome so i know if, uh, you just you reached out to me we had coffee it was a beautiful conversation as you say no agenda no, it was really, let's get to know each other and know what we're each doing. And from there, you're saying 
people know people? Is that the, the approach? Is that what happened? Yeah, I took the approach, it was a couple of years ago, um, of how do I meet new people? Well, let's do this with a social media agenda in mind as well, because that obviously generates a lot of attention and building that awareness online. But having those conversations with people where there was that free flowing conversation where they knew you weren't selling them anything, yeah. um, it opens up the mind to possibilities. And whether that's activated immediately or six months, 12 months down the line, then we have the ability to obviously um, continue that relationship and, and new opportunities come from it. It's about mm-hmm. that that back of mind stuff. It's, it's you know, ah, oh, I spoke to Robert six months ago. He's the guy for that. Mm. Or you should speak to Robert, Simon, Pipe. Um, and those mm-hmm. are the those are the um, you know benefits yeah. of that. Did you get to five hundred? Did you do five hundred? I'm not yet at five hundred. Oh, okay. I'm, okay. So how I'm, long has I'm, it been going I'm, on? It's like two and a half years. Yeah, because that's um, a lot. Five hundred coffee. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm like, like three eighty or something. It's wow. like three hundred eighty wow. new people that I didn't know before. Incredible. That is absolutely incredible. And just shows also it's taking taking a bit of a chance because you're reaching out to people. You don't know what's going to happen, but you're just happy to go with the flow and you know that it's about meeting people. It's about expanding your network. That's really, really awesome. Yeah. Good. So that was the one element. The other element was maintaining the contact, maintaining the conversation, which I think, I think is also something that's difficult to, to do if you, if you don't know how you feel like you don't know, you don't have what you say. So any tips on that? Yeah. I, th- I think, uh, again, keep natural, keep authentic, but have a system, always have a system. So okay. it could be as simple as setting a calendar entry in your, in, in your phone to say, you know, recall Daphne in three months' time, or just you know, send her a WhatsApp. Um, it just keeps that that journey going, that contact going. Mm. Don't rely on the other person to necessarily do it. Yeah. And and that comes ultimately from our sales background. Sales is all about perseverance and consistency over time. Having a particularly in, in B2B enterprise sales, you don't get the sale on the first call. It's a process over often many months of following up having new conversations, tasking yourself with reaching back out to those accounts. So you're being a leader over your own yeah. contact list, basically, yeah. and, uh, exactly. and building that in. Yeah. And I think it's important to, as you say, have a system, because if you keep it in your head, you are going to forget. So having a reminder, as you say, in the Canada, I'm big on that, put the reminders in and then reach out, think of something to share that's of value, or just say, I've been thinking about you, you know, and yeah, I think that's awesome. Awesome advice. Simon, your big learning that you spoke about was believing in yourself and battling that negative voice in your head. And I think that is something that is so, something that everyone experiences. We all know, we all have that little voice in our head that doesn't say nice things to us, especially when things go wrong, you know, like, oh, how could you say that? Why did you do that? And sometimes it could be quite rude and say, oh, you idiot, you know, how, you know, how could you? So I think that's just such an important uh, point that you're bringing in, and I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I think belief, I mean, I'm a massive believer in the psychology of everything we do in business, not just in sales, but a lot of it is about attitude, about self-belief, belief in yourself. I mean, when we first started Pipe Global, um, we, we built up decades of experience of and running successful companies, taking them to exit. Um, but when we first started giving advice in a more formal business setting where people were paying proper money for it, we were almost thinking, is this advice too basic? We sort of underestimated, I suppose, uh, what would accrued in terms of knowledge over all those years. Mm. The first, uh, I remember the first sort of meetings I was having and people were like saying, oh, can I recall this? They were taking notes. And I thought at first that they were just, that this was like almost like ABC of what we knew as, um, from our own experience. I thought that they were making fun, like, they were saying, can I take notes? They were thinking they, they, it was the opposite almost. But after a few of those conversations, I realized that what we assumed everybody knew, they didn't know because they hadn't sat in that seat before. They didn't have those same experiences. So when we set up Pipe Global to, to advise companies and help them really scale their growth, I think we maybe didn't have an, enough self-belief in what we were providing, the tips, yeah. the knowledge that we were transferring ourselves and the way we were going to coach people so I think self-belief well it's important in everything life I think it's important in in sport it's important in relationships and it's certainly important in business particularly when you're 
having to bet on yourself a bit. You're not putting all your chips into a company where, you know, for good and for bad, when you start your own operation, then it's it's everything's dependent on your own quality and, you know, your, your own advice and information you're providing. Yeah, I think you're hitting on a really important point there. And that is that when we are so used to, and we've been in a certain area operating and working in a certain area for such a long time that the things that we think are quite basic are just not basic to other people. But we take um, for granted our knowledge base and our level of experience and expertise that contributes to the value that we bring to the interaction. So we take that for granted. We think that's obvious, but it's really, really not obvious. And I have to say one of the, actually, one of the key tips that I give to leaders who are using, you know, we're all using language, we're all communicating, but in how to use language effectively is using the word obviously, you know. So what is obvious to us is really not obvious to other people. And when you use the word obviously, it puts the other person in a place of like, oh, should I know this, you know? And what you're talking about is we take for granted our own knowledge and our own experience base, and we think things are pretty obvious or, you know, sales 101, but for people who are hearing it for the first time, exposed to it for the first time, because it's not their field of expertise, this is the value that we bring. This is what we bring to the party. And they're willing to engage with us and contract with us to consult them in in these areas. So that's what we bring and noticing that particular strength of ours. I mean, also I'll take even a stage further. I'm mentoring a bunch of people, certainly currently in the past, in terms of looking for jobs. So things that I, I think Sort of been very obvious, like about when you've had an interview, then you send us a thank you note on WhatsApp or email, and this is yeah. how you do it. You tie yeah. in things you've learned in the interview and bring in how your own experience. You reiterate some of the things you've said. You show your excitement for the opportunity. I thought this would have been obvious to use obvious. that word again. To everybody. <laughs> and time and time again, people are saying, "Oh wow, I would never have acknowledged or thanked or, or taken that. Or I would have waited to hear back. Yeah. I've never taken that extra step." And sometimes just that small tip can be the difference between being a strong candidate and landing a job and just being thrown into the heat with everyone else. Exactly. It's so, so true. And and never to take for granted the thing that the things that come naturally to us, which actually are the basis of our own talents and strengths. You just uh, never take that for granted because things that come so naturally for us are actually the things that don't come naturally for other people. And that's what they need to learn about. So, yeah, really, really great uh, sharing there. Thank you. I'd love to segue into this whole co-founder relationship because you established Pat Global as co-founders. You decided to collaborate, so you're each at a point. So maybe tell us a little bit about that, how the decision came about and what made you choose to collaborate rather than go your separate ways and do your own thing. Simon and I had worked together for many years before, um, and we always thoroughly enjoyed our collaborating in that environment together and yeah. uh, knew that we had very similar values, similar approach to life, similar vision of where we wanted to see ourselves in the future, um, which is, I think, the bedrock of how you go forward as co-founders anyway. Um, exactly. you, you know, if those things aren't aligned, then you know, you're know you on a hiding to nothing. Um, and I have to then, say, I'm going to jump in there for a moment because I think from my personal experience of working with co-founders, it's always built off some relationship before. I I think there are, for sure, there are examples of co-founders coming together because they had an idea, but I'm willing to bet that the vast majority have had some relationship and sometimes even really long-term relationships and friendships before because you've got to test out that ability to work together before you jump into such a big venture. 100%, 100%. So we always knew that once we had... Um, sort of, I guess, had that that more significant exit that the future was without bosses, that we want to be our own bosses. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that manifested like was in Pipe Go Global, that we decided that we wanted to take all the knowledge that we um, had over, you know, decades, you know, probably 40, 50 years combined sales and marketing knowledge together um, and, and go and live the life that we wanted through Pipe Global as a, as the engine to do that. Um, and I think that we take it very much like a marriage to some extent. You know, we give more than we take. We are there to um, obviously support each other. Um, you know, whatever new angles come out of the business or new directions, then it's about how to give the framework to the other person to do that. 
Um, and, and no ego, no blame, you know, clients will come and go. But as long as the infrastructure is there, then, you know, we're building something that we've got a long term vision on. Um, and, you know, we see that as wanting to do it together. Mm, awesome. So I think I've done a little bit of research and reading on this and it's different numbers come up. But what I've seen a lot is that it's thought that about 75 percent of startups have co-founders. Um, and one of the three top reasons for the failure of startups is conflict between co- co-founders. So I think that's just a little bit of a juicy topic to get into. And I'd love to hear what are some of the challenges maybe in being co-founders? Well, I think to, to go back onto the conflicts, I think well, one of the reasons why we did go into business together is we would worked previously for five or six years and we hadn't ever had any conflict over that time. And that involved like plenty of trips abroad, like conferences, pressure situations, and that whole startup journey, which is up, down, up, down, up, down, which gives yeah. a lot of um, sort of background almost to, to start. Right. If you can cope with those pressures, it's the well, roller coaster, you know. <laughs> and and the, the element of trust, so the, I think the element of trust is we both know we've got the same goals, like Rob was saying. So I think when you know you're coming from the same ideals, beliefs, and, and vision, that that can help. And, and honestly, unless what could contradicts me here, we haven't ever really had any big conflicts. I mean, wow. I don't, we certainly never raise our voices to each other. Um, I, I, don't, I couldn't work with someone that was very volatile. And I need, I need to sort of almost know know what what's coming next, almost. And I think we both, like like you said before, Daphne, the fact that we knew each other's um, sort of work, not just personalities, but working personalities. It's one thing to have someone that you've you know, been to university with and been to football with and known socially. And then you say, I think those are the ones that may maybe often go wrong because you haven't worked in a business context. But when you have worked in a business context and, you know, we pulled off a, a very successful exit between us, then I, I think that 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 was what I, I never really for a second doubted that, that we couldn't make this work. So I wasn't going in there thinking, oh, no. And even though in some ways we're, we're quite similar in personality, there's other ways where, where we're not, for example. And we We've done various psychometric tests, not for this purpose, but we've seen where we differ and how our skills either complement or, or or sometimes differ, but how we can use those together. Yeah, and I think you're highlighting an important point here is also that you don't have to be the same. It's having a shared values, maybe a belief system and having shared goals for what you want to achieve, but you don't have to be the same personality or have the same way of doing things and in fact it's better if you don't because that's how each of you contribute your uniqueness and also can challenge each other and have different opinions and see how you get through so i think uh yeah i think just to share that this is not my first rodeo with a co-founder by the way okay so in the uk when i worked in commercial real estate um i set up a um a commercial real estate agency with somebody else that we'd worked together for three or four years we were close friends um and you know we understood each other very much the business was successful to some extent but we had the 2009 10 11 crash Mm -hmm. um, and that really impacted the business heavily um and it started to bring out the disparity between us both um, of what our visions were, where we wanted to take the business, the expectations of each other in the business. And actually, it wasn't aligned. And we actually parted ways. Now, we parted ways as absolute friends and remain to this day very, very close friends. But in the business context, um, it didn't have a future. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So that is interesting because there's some learnings for sure from that experience that you're bringing into your experience of co-founding today. So what would you say are some of the tips for success if you are speaking to people who are listening, who are in a business at the moment and they are joint leaders of a business? What what are some of the tips or advice that you'd give? I think you're not going to agree on everything. So you need to know that from the outset. Like Rob was saying, it's almost like um, it's got some um, synergies with marriage that you need to know to give or take, to to know when to almost like dig your heels in and fight and and when to sort of give in and and, and go with the flow a little bit. I think it has helped that we've had similar visions, et cetera. And we almost knew from the outset where we wanted to take Puck Global, um, although the speed of, of, I suppose, the success maybe surprised us a little bit as well. We weren't (laughs) sure how quickly things will take off we're prepared to be a bit more patient at the beginning but uh, I think if it's to do with having joint interest that you know when you when you're when your partner's in any enterprise you should you should have the same interest so you should be pulling apart you should be 
pulling together. I think so. Whenever we've had um, things that I could have maybe said, oh, not quite sure about that. It's the same thing as you know with your children almost. Is that is that a battle I want to have, or is it in the context of the relationship of the company, etc.? Is it better to move on and go with the flow on that? Awesome, and I think that's really, really important. Is expect the disagreements and know how to handle them when they come. Know that there's a bit of give and take, like you were saying earlier as well, Rob. Um, okay, so maybe just we coming to the end. So maybe share each of you what are your proudest moments in your career so far. Uh, I'll go first then. Um, I mean, look, there's there's a few junctures at which point you would say, I'm proud. I'm not sure there's one moment that stands out as the the biggest, but um, definitely I think, you know, taking taking those chances to set up three businesses now from start to, 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 to take to market. And, you know, the first two didn't go so well. Um, you know, the, the second one, the third one rather that Sun and I were both part of the co-founding team was extremely successful and now having you know five nearly six years under our belt of pipe global we've built foundations and i think my, my if i was to be pushed on what is my proudest moment it's probably the moment that i'm in to be honest with mm-hmm. you yes. because um it's about digging in those foundations for where you want your vision to take you yeah. and i think yeah. we're really doing that now as we you know you mature you're, we're like good wine and uh <laughs> you know there are things now in uh, i mean i'm a bit younger obviously as you can tell but uh <laughs> there are things you st- <laughs> but but there are things you start to understand about life later on and mm-hmm. and it's those things now that i think we're starting to focus on in terms of what we're building how that impacts other people within the business and how it impacts our families and the the journey that we want to take. So, yeah. you know, I think remain proud. You can't regret what happened in the past. Uh, they were the right decisions at that moment and they took you on the journey that leads you to, to this point. 100%. And Rob, actually what you're saying in there is that the journey is the the, the less successful and the more successful, the th- failures and the wins. That is the journey. You can't really expect to go on this journey of building businesses and every time you'll hit success. We know even the celebrity you know, business leaders have started things and failed in them. So that is part of the journey. And, and I love that, taking every moment that you're in and thinking, okay, what am I proud of in this moment? How can I be proud in this moment? I think that's an awesome takeaway. Thank you. Um, For me, it was was almost the intersection. I'm very into the work-life balance. It was almost the intersection of work-life balance, which was in 2004, which was a long time ago in terms of the whole work from home, moving my family um, to Israel, but keeping my job in the UK. UK, when people thought it was impossible, they said it's impossible to keep a sales job in the UK unless you go back every week, which I was not prepared to do. So, first of all, to uproot my family, go to a new location. To in two thousand and four, though Skype had only just started, I remember pitching it to my boss then in the UK and saying, "I want to live in Israel." He's like, "Well, how are you going to carry on working for us?" I said, like, "I thought it out. There's a thing called Skype, S K Y P E." <laughs> I can have a London number that rings in Israel. I was like, no, it's impossible. He said, that's just not possible. I was like, no, no, I promise you. Look, look, look at the website. How here. far we've come, right? Yeah, how far we've come. And, and so to, uh, originally I was going back once a month and, it, and I was able to, to grow it. And actually a lot of the t- tips and tactics we use now with no. our clients, this is going back almost 20 years. I was one of the first almost like SDRs, if you like. I was mm-hmm. generating my own leads in Israel because I didn't want to be on a plane every week going face to face in the UK. So I think that was probably wow. the proudest moment. Um, uh, first of all, to, um, fulfilling like a lifetime uh, long dream to, to live in Israel with my family and being able to, certainly for those first few years, it ended up being nine years in the end, wow. keeping the job wow. in the UK, wow. being able to, uh, the, the eyes were on me. I was the guy not in the office. If I wasn't at the top of the, the sales leaderboard, my head was on, on the chopping block. So yeah. being able to, to pull that off, the company exited and I stayed for a number of years at the acquiring company as well. I think that was my proudest career moment, but it also, as I said, it is an intersection with yeah. family like being yeah. able to pull off a successful immigration to Israel. I love that. And I think, you know, when you talk about proudest moments, it, it isn't a standalone. I suppose maybe for some people there are those standalone moments of a very specific business success or a very specific personal success. But when you can integrate the, the two and make something work in your business that is also enhancing your family uh 
lifestyle that makes it even more meaningful and and more impactful and i think it's really important for business leaders to remember that you're not just the business you're also your personal life your family life the lifestyle that you want to live and it's important to see that as the whole picture and you manage to achieve that at a time and as you say no one knew what Skype was and really you know going back to our conversation about taking chances taking a real chance not knowing exactly how it'll pan out but saying yes you know I'm going to do it I'm going to try it because this is what I want and backing yourself so that's really awesome Well, thank you. Uh, I think we'll just end with, we'll put all your details in the show notes so that people will know how to reach you and perhaps just final words of what you want to leave our listeners with as we say goodbye. I'll I'll give a message perhaps on a a sort of marketing tip and maybe Simon can give some sales tip to to (laughs) leave people with some great takeaway. Marketing for me is is broken. Most agencies that you'll go to or the way that people think about marketing is very, very much designed to be the commercial. Our methodology is all about turning your business into the broadcaster for its space so that you turn your business into the chat show, the media company for your sector. And we found that by using that methodology, you can really start to build value, thought leadership, and make an irrational bias towards your business in the marketplace. So for me, think about how you're going to turn your business into that chat show and and and, and use social media and all the other um, you know channels out there through marketing to to promote that concept because you'll see exponential growth you'll see clients coming straight into your own inbox and as i say this irrational bias will be created everything is commoditized in this world brand is everything and if you can create that brand through this motion and method you'll win I love that irrational bias because irrational bias to me speaks, speaks about that emotional connection. Like we have to have this. It's not like, okay, let's examine pros and cons, do the analysis. It's like, yes, this is something speaking to me here and it, I can't explain it, but I want it. So yeah, great, yeah. great takeaway. Thanks. Um, for me, it's, it's really practical lessons that we've learned at Pipe Global that I use to help my, my own clients grow their sales. And the two biggest ways we've grown at Pipe Global is through social selling. So using channels like LinkedIn, for example, and also through referrals. And that is how we've landed pretty much every one of our clients. We haven't really got outbound at all to land any clients. All of our leads have been inbound. And with sales, it's very, very hard, as we know, make it as easy as possible. And the best way to do that is to invest in social selling. So you, you become known in your industry, you're following the right people, you're gaining a reputation for having industry knowledge that's obviously attractive when people are buying a product from you. And also, the, the, all the stats, I know you were quoting a lot of stats about um, leaders, et cetera, but the stats on referrals are like crazy. Like the amount, the likelihood of buying from when you've been referred compared to going outbound. So for sure, we help clients with their outbound strategies and we've got some good tips and hacks to make that as smooth and effective as possible. But why stop there? Let's start from the social selling and the referrals because if you can build a business that way, not only are you going to close more deals, but those clients themselves are going to stay longer and pay more money. I love that. And I can totally relate because I think... uh... It's, it's both. It's, a, as you say, the social selling, people who might not know you, but you're building up that thought leadership, but also the referrals, the value of a referral is, it is, it's priceless. So how do you actually, uh, what's the word, capitalize on that or build that to a level where it's also becoming almost like a, an engine that's, uh, creating more for your business? Thank you. So. Yes. For the, for you listening out there, if you want to learn more about, really getting that uh, sales engine and marketing engine working in your business, reach out to Rob and Simon, give us the website address just so that we have it here on the audio and that will also go in the show notes. What is it? It's um, pipe.global. Okay, pipe.global. Awesome. And you're both on LinkedIn. So reach out, speak to Rob, Simon, you'll have an awesome conversation. And thank you so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our chat and uh, look forward to seeing lots more of you. Thank you, Daphne.